Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, hi, Rockbrook. Hello, Rockbrook Church. Thank you so much for joining us in this service today. And a big thank you to everyone behind the scenes uh, that's making this happen and making this work. How incredible. I love this church. I love you. I thank you so much for being a light in these dark days. And I want to just give a specific thank you to you as a church body for your giving over the last really three months of just your faithful and consistent giving. Uh, We believe in being generous and uh, your giving has enabled Rockbrook as a church body to be generous as well uh, to several other ministries and churches. In fact, one of the leaders of one of the churches sent a thank you video to you and he said, "Uh, Pastor Ryland, would you please show this to your church this weekend? So let's watch this together. Rockbrook Church. I just want to come to you. Uh, I am your brother. I'm your nephew. I'm your friend. I'm your cousin. My name is Ricky Brown and I'm the founder and lead pastor of a church called New Creation Church in the High Park neighborhood of Chicago. And I am so thankful for your pastor and your founding pastor uh, for their love and generosity and the Rockbrook Church family generosity towards New Creation Church. I want you to know that we received a generous gift from you in these very difficult times, and it's not without you that we reach the souls that we reach. So I want you to know that on Sunday evenings, we have a very vibrant uh, leadership cohort that is happening, uh, where people who uh, are experiencing church for the very first time are now being changed as godly, are now being changed and transformed as godly Christian leaders. And we have uh, several digital communities that meet online, as well as a course called Alpha that meets online on Thursday nights. And that's designed for people who have questions about the Christian faith or are discovering Jesus. So listen, hey, to Ryland, to Pastor Kerry, Pastor Ryland, Pastor Walter, all of you guys, everyone at Rockbrook Church, thank you so much for your generosity towards us. It's because of you that we're able to extend and expand God's kingdom. God bless you. Oh, wonderful. I love it. And much love to New Creation Church. And thank you, Rockbrook Church. As John said, next weekend, June 13th and 14th, we begin to regather. And of course, I made a big update on that. And uh, we have that uh, everywhere. And so I encourage you, I'm not going to repeat everything John just said or everything in the update, but I encourage you to look for that. And I am so excited for next weekend. Uh, The last few weeks, we have been studying the prophet Elisha and looking at how his life and faith can help us when faith is hard, when faith is hard. I'm pushing pause on that series this weekend to look at what scripture has to say about racism. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you're under stress, your natural bias tend to rise. So when we're under tension, which we've all been under tension lately. Can I get a better amen, somebody in your home? We have been under tension. And when that happens, we are more prejudiced toward other people. Now, the Bible calls this self-centered or even sinful bias. It has a word for it. It calls it the sin of partiality. The sin of partiality. Second Chronicles 7, uh, 19, 7 says, Fear the Lord and judge with integrity. For the Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or the taking of bribes. God is a just God. And this word righteousness, the word righteousness and justice are actually the same. They come from the same word. God is righteous. God is just. He hates injustice. He hates perverted forms of revenge, perverted forms of justice. And God does not tolerate partiality now and and that partiality that's just an old English word for what today we would use the word prejudice or discrimination or bigotry and there are different kinds of prejudice meaning there are many different forms of bias okay we can be prejudiced based on someone's appearance 
We can discriminate towards age. You're too young. You're too old. Uh, we can, uh, achievement, that's another prejudice. You know, we love superstars and we love to give them special treatment. We like to look up to them. We like to make them role models, whether or not, whether they deserve it or not. We model our lives and opinions after them, whether they deserve it or not. We can discriminate based on a person's wealth. Like everyone who makes a certain amount of money has the same mindsets or tendencies or failures or successes. And the area of partiality, the area of discrimination or prejudice that we're going to address today is the prejudice of racism. And my prayer is that as we go into this, that you would take a moment this weekend in the midst of all the noise, that you would take a moment and listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say about your life. Because I know you can watch TV and you can get on social media and you can find out about this person and that person and make judgments on what they think and what they're saying or what they're doing. But my prayer is that you would lean into the Holy Spirit today. And anytime you talk about race, there's no easy answers and it's easy to get it wrong. And I just want to say myself sincerely today and to set an example to our church family that if I say something wrong and you are part of a minority, I warmly and humbly welcome your input and your suggestions because nobody gets it right all the time. And this week I've already made phone calls and done a lot of listening and there are all kinds of attitudes that we can have as we approach the sin of racism. Uh, there's the attitude of being actively involved in bigotry. Okay, there's the attitude of maybe it's not you're actively involved in it, you're actively avoiding it. You're uncomfortable and you want to avoid this topic. Um, there's the attitude of being insensitive to hurt, to what hurts others and it disrespects others, but you're going you're gonna to keep going. There's the attitude of apathy, that those who would say, you know what, I'm not a racist, I'm not an avoider, I'm not insensitive, I just, I, don't, I just don't care. But if you're a follower of Christ, you're commanded to care. God wants you to care. And the way that many people are saying this today is that it's not enough to not be a racist you must be an anti-racist. And fascinating that God already has a word for this, okay? That Christ followers already have a word for this. What God wants us all to be is a reconciler. A reconciler is someone who builds bridges. The Bible says multiple times that if you are a Christian, you must be a reconciler. And God has given us the ministry of, of reconciliation in a society that we see as being pulled apart and pulled apart and more polarized and more demonized and more distracted and more divided. And if anybody needs to have a peacemaker, it ought to be God's people. It ought to be the people of Christ. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. So God wants us to be reconcilers. Why is this such a big deal to God? And why does God hate racial prejudice so much? Let me give you four reasons. If you're taking notes, maybe open up your app, Rockbrook app and take notes there. But racial prejudice, first of all, questions God's creation. We looked at this in the week one of the, or a few weeks ago on the message on honor, that it was God's design that we would be different. He thought up gender, that was his idea. He thought of making us different shapes and sizes. Uh, he didn't make us all the same. And a prejudiced person, a, a racist, a bigot, is essentially saying, God, you made a mistake when you made that person that way. And you should have made them more like me. And it's a blatant expression of pride, of arrogance, of narcissism. It basically says, God, I know better than you, and I wouldn't have created all these people. I would have made everyone 
like me. Acts 17, 26 says, from one man, now Adam, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. So he determined it. We all came from the same source anyway, Adam and Eve, and you did not choose when you would be born in that lineage. You did not choose the color of your skin. You did not choose who your parents are, your background, your culture, the nationality. And so it just makes no sense for someone to feel pride or to feel guilt about where they're from. What nationality, the color of their skin, really anything else about them. You did not have any choice in about it. it. It doesn't say anything about your character. You just happen to be born to a certain family at a certain time. What a foolish thing to look down on somebody else about. So racial prejudice, it questions God's creation. Secondly, God hates racial prejudice because it's a sign of ignorance. It's a sign of ignorance. When we celebrate division or when we look down on someone because of their race, we are revealing our foolishness. We're, re we're revealing our darkness. We're revealing we don't understand God's plan. When we are prejudiced in this way, we're saying, I don't understand God's purpose. I don't understand God's plan. 1 John 2.11 says, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And anytime I show favoritism or shame, I'm walking around in blindness, in darkness. On the other hand, the opposite is true. The wiser you become in life, the more wisdom you have, the more unprejudiced you're going to be. So here's on the other hand in the book of James, 317, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving. In fact, let's, let's back up and read this verse, this whole verse out loud together. Let's go. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. You see, Knowledge shows up on a test, but wisdom shows up in relationships. All of these words that we just read out loud together are relational words related to wisdom. Knowledge shows up on a test. Wisdom shows up in your relationship. These are not intellectual words. These are relational words. Number three, racial prejudice. Why does God hate it? Because it disobeys the great commandment. It's not only showing my ignorance, okay? It's not only rejecting God's creation, it's disobeying the great commandment. What's the great commandment? Uh, Jesus uh, summarized all of the law, all of the commands into one sentence, and then Paul repeats it later in the New Testament in Galatians 5, where it says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He's saying instead of, if instead of showing love, you attack and tear each other apart, you're destroying yourselves. The division, the angry words, the sarcasm, it's just tearing us apart. The Pharisees came to Jesus one time and they asked, okay, you say... Love your neighbor as yourself is the most important command next to loving God with all your heart. And they ask, does that just mean literally my neighbor or does that mean everybody who exists? And to answer that question, Jesus told the story of the good Samaritan as an answer to who is my neighbor. And the good Samaritan, if you remember, is about racial reconciliation. Because the hero in that story, the good Samaritan, is a hated minority. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. And I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus' answer, and I'm absolutely convinced that the church, which is the body of Christ, is to be the answer to racism and every other kind of prejudice. Okay, we'll talk about that more. Well, let's look at the fourth thing, why God hates racial prejudice, and that is because it's a serious sin. 
It's a serious sin. God hates racism. It grieves him. It's not a sin that God just shrugs his shoulders about. It's a sin that anger, angers him. James 2, 8 through 9 says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism and you, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now that's pretty clear. But you know what? All around the world, you find racial prejudice. It's one of the most prevalent sins in the world because no matter where you go in the world, groups of people hate other groups of people for sinful, ignorant reasons. One tribe doesn't like another tribe. Uh, The northern people of this country don't like the southern people of this country. And this dark skin and light skin group in the same nation don't like each other. And on and on and on. And you can find it everywhere. The racial reconciliation and getting this out of our hearts is not some minor issue to God. It's at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of the gospel. The gospel means good news. So here's the good news. And that is, as Christians, we know this is possible. Okay? We know that people can change by the power of God. When Christ's love enters your life, it changes you. We have seen We have seen drunks get sober. We have seen addicts get clean. We have seen marriages be put back together. We have seen those who have been abused recover and thrive in life. And if I didn't believe in the power of the gospel, I would not be here today. Above my desk hangs a piece of framed music and it was given, this was given to me by the worship team when I transitioned three years ago from worship pastor to lead pastor. And they signed, the worship team signed the back of it. And so there's all these notes and names on the back of here. There's Kyle and there's Andrea and Chris and Teresa and Ted and just many other names and wonderful notes of encouragement. And it hangs above my desk. But there's another name on here on the front of this that I look at, and it's the name John Newton. John Newton. I don't know if you know who he is, but about 250 years ago, John Newton was a vile, filthy, vulgar piece of humanity. He was a slave trader. He was English, and he would go to Africa and steal Africans and then transport them to America and sell them as slaves. But God got a hold of his heart, and Jesus Christ entered his life, and his heart was so softened that John actually became a pastor, and he wrote the words to the hymn, Amazing Grace. That song, Amazing Grace, Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me was written by a slave trader. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That is a man who had a total transformation. And this hymn is sung all over America. And it was sung three days ago at the funeral of George Floyd. And that's the power of the gospel, and that's the power of what God can do in a heart. And how can the power of the gospel go to work in our life? How do we root out this racial, this racial prejudice in our lives? Well, I could give you many things uh, today, but let's, let's start. I want to start with this and, and get you thinking and get you repenting in this area. Number one, if we really want to root out racial prejudice in our lives, we've got to learn to see people as God does. It starts with how you see people. And we must learn to look at people like God does. Now, we don't, we don't do this naturally. We don't do this naturally. It has to be learned. 
And you're going to need to ask God for help. How do I learn to see everybody who comes into my life the way that God sees them? 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's looking much more deeply, and we've got to look at the heart. You know, people tend to make judgments about you when they see you for the first time. They make their judgment in the first 30 seconds. So not only are books judged by their covers, not only are houses judged by their curb appeal, but people are judged for ignorant, sinful reasons. John 7, 24, Jesus, he tells a story and then, or he's making a a, a sermon point here, but then he sums it all up in the end by saying, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Judge correctly. How do you judge correctly? By seeing people the way God sees them. The Bible is really full of examples of cultural prejudice and racial prejudice. The whole, the whole book of Jonah and everything that happens to Jonah is because Jonah hated the people that God was sending him to to preach. And Jonah knew if he went that God would forgive them and Jonah did not want to forgive or see God forgive the race that Jonah hated. I mean, even Peter, one of the greatest disciples, had to overcome his prejudice against non-Jews. He had been raised as a strict Jew, and as a strict Jew, he couldn't even touch a non-Jew, which were, who were called Gentiles. And so in order to spread the gospel, God had to give Peter a dream to break through the prejudice against other people that were not like him. And God gave him a dream to prepare him to reach non-Jews around the world. Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, who was a non-Jew. He was a Roman. And Peter goes to his house, which was really illegal for him to do in those days. And it says this in Acts 10, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. They go on in their conversation and then uh, Peter began to speak this. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So I'm going to ask you this week to start seeing people And start asking God to help you see people differently. So it starts with looking. Now, the the second step is to change uh, how you hear things. So first, we're going to correct how we see. And then secondly, we're going to address how we hear. And that's number two. Write this down. We're going to listen to everyone with respect. So if you're going to be non-prejudiced, if you're going to be a non-prejudiced person, you must listen to everyone with respect. Now, That does not mean that you have to agree with everything, but you listen to everyone with respect. Because prejudice, when you cut it all down, prejudice is a failure to listen. The less I listen to people, the more prejudiced I'll be. The word prejudice actually comes from the word to prejudge. And when you prejudge somebody without listening to them, You are prejudiced. James 1, 19 through 20, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Do we want God's righteousness in our lives? Yes. Do we want God's righteousness in our nation? Yes. Do we achieve it through anger? No. Now, does that say that we should never be angry? Uh, No, of course not. There's a lot of things that we should be angry about, and we should be angry about injustice. But there's a difference between godly anger, which is for somebody else. Godly anger is selfless. Human anger is centered on self. And when you get angry, it blocks your ability to listen. When I'm angry at you, you can say all you want, I can't hear it. When you're angry at me, I can say all I want, you don't 
hear it. And anger blocks the ability to listen. So as a reconciler in the world, as a representative of God, as an agent of Jesus Christ, we have to learn some skills to be able to break through this so we can hear one another. We've got to learn some skills on how to diffuse somebody's anger and how to diffuse somebody when they're angry. I want you to just, not in your notes, but jot down a couple of these skills, a couple of suggestions. Number one, when you listen, listen to their hurt, not their words. Listen to their hurt, not their words. When people are angry, they say all kinds of things that they don't really mean, that they don't really believe. In fact, later, they're probably going to regret it, that, regret it and wish that they hadn't even said them. And if you listen to only people's words, you're going to be offended in life very, very easily. But you don't have to listen to people's words to listen to their hurt. What's the hurt behind their anger? What's the hurt behind the words and if we just dismiss people because we don't like exactly how they're telling us that they're angry we're going to miss it and if we just get defensive at their anger we miss the hurt that we're called to minister to and if you can look at them not as angry but as hurt you're going to be more sympathetic we're more sympathetic to people who are hurt than to people who are angry and so we have to reinterpret someone's anger. That it's, they're afraid. They're scared. They're hurting. And when you reinterpret their anger as hurt, it makes you more willing to listen. If you do that, you'll become wise. Here, here's another tool, another way to uh, be a minister of reconciliation. So you listen to their hurt, not their words. Here's a second tip. You may want to write this down. Begin using the phrase, I agree. I agree. Phrases like, I agree. Phrases like, tell me more, will turn you into a peacemaker. And you might say, well, Ryland, there's a lot I don't agree with, and don't you want me to stand for the truth? Absolutely. I'm not suggesting that you just agree with whoever's talking and whatever is being said. What I'm encouraging you to do is find the common ground. You search for, you search for, you listen, and you listen to find the common ground because we're never going to find a solution if we can't even mutually express that there is a problem. And today, what we have is so many people talking past one another, and they're saying, yeah, but, instead of, I agree. We keep wanting to play the devil's advocate and pivot to different points, all the while agreement is what's going to make the difference. And no, you don't have to agree with everything to find something to agree on and begin building from there. If someone says, black lives matter, can you not agree with that? Can you not find agreement on the fact that black lives do matter? I'm not talking about an organization. I'm not talking about every solution that's being proposed. I'm talking about the statement and the fact that we should all be able to agree on. Psalm 133.1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And as peacemakers, as, build, as bridge builders, as reconcilers, we can find agreement in the pain. And there's something powerful when you start with, I love you, I agree with you, I see your hurt, I stand with you. And I'll tell you, by and large, I've heard a lot of empathy and a lot of agreement from people in our church. But I will tell you, I have heard some things this week and I have seen some things posted online from you that are insensitive, disgraceful, disrespectful and you need to rethink some of the sarcastic or insensitive things that you've posted and parents I would encourage you to know what your kids are posting online who they are following what they are liking because when you speak when you post when you respond you represent the body of Christ you represent the truth of God and I would hope that you would not want to say anything or do anything that would harm the body of Christ 
Let's go to a third way that we root out racial prejudice from our lives, and that is that we must love everybody the way Jesus does. We must love everybody the way Jesus does. There's nobody I'm allowed not to love. Even if we could not find any agreement, I will show them love. John 15, 12, Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. How, are you, how does Jesus love other people unconditionally, freely, completely, continually? And this is difficult. I mean, I, I can't think of a harder command, but I will spend my life trying to learn and asking God to empower me. Love is very, very practical. Love is when you want and you do what's best for someone. And how in the world are we going to build a society where we're doing that for one another with all the differences and all the violence and all the hatred and all the prejudice on many different sides? How are we going to build a society like that? God's plan to change society, God's plan to change the world. You might write this down. God's plan to bring people together is the church. It's the church. The church is to model harmony and unity and fellowship and reconciliation. Paul explained the church this way. He says, some of us are Jews and some of us are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves. Some of us are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. All of you together are Christ's body. And each of you is a part of it. Did you know that you are needed in the body of Christ? You're needed in the family of God. You're needed in a church home. We need you for many, many reasons. We need each other because none of us are complete in and of ourselves. We all have weaknesses. None of us have all the gifts. Secondly, we we need a church home because we can't model reconciliation by ourselves. I mean, it's easy to love people like you. But if God was to show you real love, he wouldn't separate you from humanity, put you on a mountaintop somewhere. He wouldn't separate you and isolate you. No, to teach you real love, he's going to put you around people who are different. Not wrong, just different. And we cannot model reconciliation by ourselves. Another reason we need the church is because we find our identity in relationships. We find our identity in relationships because, friend, our world is fracturing. Our world is is fractured more and more and more into many divisions, and it's literally crumbling in all these divisions. And there is a crisis of identity in the world. It's probably the most common crisis in our modern culture. People are going, I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am, what I am, what gender I am, what person I am, what culture I am, what race am I. And we see this struggle literally everywhere, in race, in sexuality, in every place of our world. We say, what is my place? Why? Because when relationships are broken, people do not know who they are. And God wants to tell you that you're his You're his. A sincere recognition of Christ's sacrifice realigns our values in such a way that it makes prejudice views impossible. Because for the person, the person who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, any individual they encounter falls into just one of two categories. Either a brother or sister in Christ or someone who is separated from God and to whom I'm called to love and to minister to So I want to lead you in a prayer at the end of this. We do this at the end of every sermon, every week. It's an opportunity to commit ourselves to the truths of the word that we looked at this day and an opportunity to commit to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to lead you in this prayer because he is available to all. And if you're not in the family of God and you've never received Jesus Christ, you can do that today. But I want to say to those of you who have been mistreated unjustly because of your race, because of your age, because of your heritage, because of your economic status, for any reason. It it would be insensitive for me to say, I understand. 
But I can confidently say to you today, there is one who truly, really understands. There is a Savior, your Savior, understands because he was treated unjustly too. And only the injustice of what was done to Jesus on the cross is powerful enough to stop injustice in our world. Would you pray with me? I would encourage you wherever you are in in your home or wherever you're watching this to to just turn to God right now. Maybe maybe you even do something to change your posture. You bow your head or you open your hands before him. You kneel before him. God, I want to thank you for the people who've listened to this message and Now I'm going to ask you to listen to their prayers as they pray. Just pray this simple prayer. Say, Jesus Christ, thank you for making me who you made me to be. Just say that to him. God, thank you for making me who you made me to be. You chose my race. You chose my nationality. I had nothing to do with any of these in You made me to be who I am. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, Jesus Christ. As much as I know how, I'm asking you to come into my life. I want to begin a life with you and a life of purpose and a life of meaning. And I want to follow you from this day forward. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.